Greetings and welcome back to 303 and our lecture on uh, Darwin's Voyage of the Beagle. Let's continue now with the journey home. It's fascinating the way that Darwin, no matter where he is, and I think in this regard he's a, he's a great kind of model for all of us, he's always curious, he's always trying to learn. We, we've talked in 303 often about being a lifelong learner, and, and this is of course Darwin on his, dry, uh, on his sailing home uh, back, to, uh, back to England through the Indian Sea especially, he loved to take a look at reef formations, and there's these really great drawings in, uh, in the volume that you'll love. Uh, by May 31st, they're at the southern tip of Africa, the Cape of Good Hope. They will um, uh, take a break uh, on shore in Cape Town, um, and then um, they're, they're going to meet with scientific um, uh, blue bloods, um, and they're gonna study some local geology, um, and in fact, Darwin gets to meet um, Sir John Herschel, which is one of the, uh, one of the, uh, of the great geologists. He also gets a letter um, um, from England when he's here that Henslow has edited and published 10 of his letters uh, in this booklet. Uh, and there's been some really good reviews. I mean, it, you get this sense by the end of the journals at the end of the five years that Darwin understands that something profound has happened both to him and not just to him, but also to the field of, uh, of uh, natural science, biology, and the like, right? He leaves Cape Town, the long journey obviously home, and he begins to put together his notes, all, all, of, the, all of the stuff that he still has on board with him. Um, that is to say, the real work is about to start. And he leaves, many have argued this, he's le he leaves as a young child almost, and he comes back as an adult, and he's ready to go to work, right? Um, he's got 1,300 pages of different kinds of notes um, on geology. He's got about 370, almost 400 pages on zoology. Um, he's got a, a, a catalog of some 1,529 species. He's collected 3,907 uh, 3, specimens of other kinds. Um, and and, and uh, he knew, right, that once he got back, that there was, there was all kinds of excellent things waiting for him in his future. Um, Charles Lyell, the great geologist whose principles of geology Darwin had been reading and studying, annotating all the time that he had been gone, um, um, was obviously very excited about what was going on. Also, um, a uh, professor um, that he had had some contact with, Adam Sedgwick, was uh, very excited. He had spent a summer month exploring um, some geology in North Wales. He stops, Darwin stops, at several of the familiar points uh, as he's headed back home. San Jago, where uh, the, the, the Beagle, as we had said, had already made its first landing five years earlier. Um, and finally, on October the 2nd, 1836, he arrives in England. Um, on the, um, he goes to, to Falmouth, and he rushes home, right? He gets home. Uh, to Shrewsbury to see his family. Um, he gets there, however, late. I love this story. He gets there late, and so he just, instead of making a big deal about it, because, I mean, it's not like he's texting, right, like we would today, and so he just goes to his room, and he goes to sleep, and in the morning, you know, he, he, he wakes up, and everyone's just kind of blown away by the fact that there's Charles. He's back after five years gone, right? Um, th there was apparently some weight loss that had happened, which makes sense if you read it all about all the all the walking that they did. Uh, that they did, and it's at this point that, of course, Charles Darwin's life has uh, been set, and and uh, you know it, the world will never be the same. Either Charles Darwin's world will never be the same, and obviously the the world as we know it, and especially in the fields of of science and the like, and never going to be the same. Now, with that in mind, what I, I and again, I, guys, like I've always said to you, I love to, I love to read uh, passages with you. I don't, I, obviously, I can't read all of this, but I will read a little bit um, with you, ju jumping in and out of different chapters to just give you a sense of, of Darwin's brilliant prose. I mean, just listening to some of these opening lines from the very first chapter, he says, uh, "The neighborhood of uh, Porto Praia," he says, "viewed from the sea, where it's a desolate aspect." The volcanic fires of a past age and the scorching heat of a tropical sun have in most places rendered the soil unfit for vegetation. The country rises in successive steps 
of tableland interspersed with some truncated conical hills, and the horizon is bounded by an irregular chain of more lofty mountains, the scene, as beheld through the hazy atmosphere of this climate, is one of great interest, if indeed a person fresh from sea and who has just walked for the first time in a grove of coconut trees cannot be a judge of anything but his own happiness. We'll have these kinds of moments that are almost like prose poetry for us, where Darwin just gets really excited about some of the stuff that he is witnessing. Um, continuing in chapter uh, um, uh, one, he says it this way, the often repeated description of the stately palm and other notable tropical plants, then birds, and lastly man, taking possession of the coral islets as soon as formed in the Pacific is probably not correct. I fear it destroys the poetry of the story that feather and dirt feeding and parasitic insects and spiders should be the first inhabitants of newly formed oceanic land. Um, I love that line, destroys the poetry of the story. And it tells us that Darwin was himself in some ways self-referential about the kind of composition that he was playing with here. Um, and he knew he wanted to write something that would allow people to be really challenged, blown away. There is a moment in Rio uh, in the second chapter that many scholars have pointed out is some of the more important lines early on. Um, Darwin was raised to abhor the idea of slavery. And so his, 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 uh, the racism that he witnesses just horrifies him. But there is one passage that early on in chapter 2 he, uh, he writes about that will uh, uh, carry all kinds of powerful resonances throughout the years to come. He says it this way. While staying in an estate, I was fairly nearly being an eyewitness to one of those atrocious acts which can only take place in a slave country. Owing to a quarrel and a lawsuit, the owner was on the point of taking all the women and children from the male slaves and selling them separately at the public auction at Rio. Interest and not any feeling of compassion prevented this act. Indeed, I do not believe the inhumanity of separating 30 families who had lived together for, mere, for many years even occurred to the owner. Yet, I will pledge myself that in humanity and in good feeling he was superior to the common run of men. It may be said there exists no limit to the blindness of interest and selfish habit. I may mention one very trifling anecdote which at the time struck me more forcibly than any story of cruelty. I was crossing a ferry with a Negro who was uncommonly stupid. Now again, this word, we don't use this word today, obviously used by Darwin, used of course in uh, Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream speech. We've made comments about it elsewhere. In endeavoring to make him understand, that is to say, this uh, black person he was trying to talk to, in endeavoring to make him understand, I talked loud and made signs in which, in, in doing which, uh, as he's making his signs, I passed my hand near his face. He, I suppose, thought I was in a passion and was going to strike him, for instantly, with a frightened look and half shut eyes, he dropped his hands. I shall never forget my feelings of surprise, disgust, and shame at seeing a great powerful man, afraid even to ward off a blow directed, as he thought, at his face. This man had been trained to a degradation lower than the slavery of the most helpless animal. Um, uh, this, of course, compelling, compelling information, right? And I think worthy of reading and then, of course, rereading. Um, in the third chapter, we, we, we you know, kind of forget that doing this kind of an activity is not like it is today. And uh, I mean, it's not that it's completely safe, but it, it, there was some serious danger involved in some of the stuff he was doing. For example, in the, uh, in the third chapter, we hear about it this way. He says, I may mention as a proof of how cheap everything is in this country that I paid only $2 a day or eight shillings for two men together with a troop of, other, of about a dozen riding horses. My companions were well armed with pistols and sabers, a precaution which I thought rather unnecessary. But the first piece of news we heard was that the day before a traveler from Montevideo had been found dead on the road with his throat cut. This happened close to across the record of a former murder. Um, you know, it just gives you a sense. In the fifth chapter, uh, we get this uh, this observation, which is uh, which is um, uh, it, it, I think you know one of the reasons why this text sold so popularly was uh, uh, passages like this. He's talking about an expression of a snake's face. 
He says it this way. The expression of the snake's face was hideous and fierce. The pupil consisted of a vertical slit in a molten and coppery iris. The jaws were broad at the base and the nose terminated in a triangular projection. I do not think I ever saw anything more ugly excepting perhaps some of the vampire bats. I imagine this repulsive aspect originates from the features being placed in positions with respect to each other, somewhat proportional to those of the human face, and thus we often uh, and, and thus we obtain a scale of hideousness. In the fifth chapter, a few, a few pages later, he says it this way. Um, he says um, uh, about uh, a certain group of men that he had met in uh, Bahia Blanca waiting for the beagle. He said, um, they passed the night there. It was impossible to conceive anything more wild and savage than the scene of their bivouac. Some drank till they were intoxicated, others swallowed the streaming blood of the cattle slaughtered for their suppers, and then being sick from drunkenness, they cast it up again and were besmeared with filth and gore. I think this kind of, uh, you know, descriptions will help in some ways explain why some people loved to read this kind of material. Um, in the seventh chapter, we get Darwin as political scientist as he's talking about Paraguay. He says it this way, when the old bloody-minded tyrant has gone to his long account, Paraguay will be torn by revolutions, violent in proportion to the previous unnatural calm. That country will have to learn, like every other South American state, that a republic cannot succeed till it contains a certain body of men imbued with the principles of justice and honor. Well, of course, that sounds very much, much at 3A, like our study of Plato's Republic, no question. Um, from there, we'll jump to chapter 8 and his uh, discussions of Patagonia. And um, uh, just because uh, it's so much fun and, and Shelley is such a hero in 303 for us, um, he will quote, in fact, uh, about uh, one of the ages, he says, in uh, chapter 8 about Patagonia. One asks how many ages the plane had thus lasted and how many more it was doomed thus to continue. And he quotes Shelley's lines on uh, uh, Mont Blanc. None can reply, all seems eternal now. The wilderness has a mysterious tongue which teaches awful doubt. Uh, I, I just want to point out at 3A that Darwin himself was a great reader, and obviously a great reader of wonderful poetry, we might say. A few lines later, we have some, uh, some amazing lines. He says, it's impossible to reflect on the changed state of the American continent without the deepest astonishment. Uh, formerly, it must have swarmed with great monsters. Now we find mere pygmies compared with the antecedent allied races. Um, and, and then by chapter 9, he's uh, ready to tell us about a condor that he shot, which, you know, will obviously upset us because we love, you know, we love the birds. But he says, this day I shot a condor. It measured from tip to tip of the wings eight and a half feet, and from beak to tail four feet. The bird's known to have a wide geographical range, being found on the west coast of South America, and the Strait of Magellan, and on and on and on he goes, right? So he kind of celebrates this. But what I find fascinating about Darwin is just a few lines later, we have Darwin the poet, as he says, the movement of the neck and the body of the condor, we must suppose, is sufficient for this. However this may be, it is truly wonderful and beautiful to see so great a bird, hour after hour, without any apparent exertion, wheeling and gliding over mountain and river. I love this, that Darwin feels that he needs to share with us this almost like poetic energy of awe, and, and it's, quite, it's quite remarkable. By chapter 10, we're at the heart of the book uh, in his um, Tierra del Fuego uh, uh, um, comments. Again, I wish I could read more of this stuff to you, but I will just jump in for a few moments because I think this kind of stuff is what made Darwin's book so much fun to read, so challenging. I mean, we'll, we live in a different time, so you, you know what we read here is obviously going to be shocking, but not as shocking, right? He talks a little bit about cannibals, right? Everybody wants to know about cannibals, so here he goes. Um, he says, the different tribes when at war are cannibals, right? From the concurrent but quite independent evidence of the boy taken by Mr. Lowe and of Jim, uh, uh, Jimmy Button, it is certainly true that when pressed in winter by hunger, they kill and devour their old women before they kill their dogs. The boy being asked by Mr. Lowe why they did this answered, Doggies catch otters. Old women, no. This boy described the manner in which they were killed by being held over smoke and thus choked. He imitated their screams as a joke. 
and describe the parts of their body which are considered best to eat. Horrid as such a death by the hands of their friends and relatives must be, the fears of the old women, Darwin says, when hunger begins to press, are more painful to think of. We're told that they often run away into the mountains, but that they are pursued by the men and brought back to the slaughterhouse at their own firesides. And then Darwin uses an exclamation point in the passage to just drive his point home. Um, and and, and, and uh, finally, just to finish, in the 21st chapter, at the final chapter, um, the way in which Darwin's going to kind of finish up this project, I'll just, I'll just jump in, um, in into just a few observations. The first I want to comment on is uh, at the very end, as Darwin is coming to the end of his, of, of his discussion, it does very much seem that he wants to make it clear how much he abhors the very act of slavery. And he gives some descriptions about slave owners that have these terrible cr screws that crush fingers of, of the slaves and the like. He says um, about, about slavery, it's often attempted, he says, to palliate slavery by comparing the state of slaves with our poor countrymen. If the misery of our poor be caused not by the laws of nature, but by our institutions, great is our sin. But how this bears on slavery, I cannot see. He says, as well might the use of the thumb screw be defended in one land by showing that men in another land suffered from some dreadful disease. Those who look tenderly at the slave owner and with a cold heart of the slave never seem to put themselves into the position of the latter. I think this is really, really important. We've said this obviously many, many times that the only way racism is ever fully addressed is to try to take the perspective of the other, as we've said in our lectures on uh, Harper Lee's um, To Go Mockingbird, that, that notion that you have to walk in another man's shoes, another man's moccasins, right? Uh, what a, he, says, he says it this way, what a cheerless prospect with not even a hope of change. Picture to yourself the chance ever hanging over you of your wife or your little children, those objects which nature urges even the slave to call his own, being torn from you and sold like beasts to the first bidder. And these deeds are done and palliated by men who profess to love their neighbors as themselves, who believe in God and pray that this that his will be done on earth. By the way, we've got exclamation marks as you're reading this because obviously Darwin wants to drive the point home. He says it not next, and this obviously stepping out of his objective scientific voice into a real voice, his human voice. He says, it makes one's blood boil, yet heart tremble, to think that we Englishmen and our American descendants, with their boastful cry of liberty, have been and are so guilty. But he says, it is a consolation to reflect that we at least have made a greater sacrifice than ever made by any nation to expiate our sin, obviously speaking for the English, right? Um, and then finally, I, I love the way that he ends uh, this, uh, this text. He says, It's been said that the love of the chase is an inherent delight in man, a relic of an instinctive passion. We think, obviously, of, of, of Homer's Odyssey, right? If so, I'm sure the pleasure of living in the open air with the sky for a roof and the ground for a table, we're reminded, obviously, of Whitman's Song of the Open Road, right? Living in the open air. Um, and the ground for a table is part of the same feeling. It is the savage returning to his wild and native habits. I always look back to our boat cruises and my land journeys, when through, when, when through unfrequented countries with an extreme delight which no scenes of civilization could have created. I do not doubt that every traveler must remember the glowing sense of happiness which he experienced when he first breathed in a foreign clime, where the civilized man had seldom or never trod. And then a few lines later, from seeing the present states, it's impossible not to look forward with high expectations to the future progress, nearly an entire hemisphere. Um, obviously, this is the hope, right, of Darwin, his optimism, right? The march of improvement consequent on the introduction of Christianity throughout the South Sea probably stands by itself in the records of history. It's the more striking when we remember that only 60 years since, Cook, whose excellent judgment none will dispute, could foresee no prospect of a change. Yet these changes have now been affected by the philanthropic spirit of the British nation. Well, obviously, one can debate the philanthropic spirit of the British and, of course, the American nation as well. In conclusion, final lines. It appears to me 
that nothing can be more improving to a young naturalist than a journey in distant countries. And we, of course, have said this many times, that you know, following on Keats's uh, Chapman's Homer, much of I traveled in the realms of gold, travel as reading. Um, obviously, it makes a lot of sense to try and see as much of the world as one can, especially when one's young. He says, in both uh, traveling, it both sharpens and partly allays that wanton craving, which is Sir J. Herschel remarks, a man experiences through every corporal sense by uh, being uh, fully satisfied. The excitement from the novelty of objects and the chance of success stimulate him to increased activity. Moreover, as a number of isolated facts soon become uninteresting, the habit of comparison leads to generalizations. We think, obviously, of our 303 notion of what makes great learning, the connecting, the meaningful connection of uh, uh, relating of new information, old information. On the other hand, as the traveler stays but a short time in each place, his descriptions must generally consist of mere sketches instead of detailed observations. Hence arises, as I've found at my cost, a constant tendency to fill up the wide gaps of knowledge by inaccurate and superficial hypotheses. The fallibilist position in terms of our big five, right? That is to say, epistemological fallibility. I, uh, if, you don't, if you don't spend a lot of time right, observing within a culture, you're going to make generalizations, many of which will be flawed. But he says, I have too deeply enjoyed the voyage, not to recommend any naturalist, although he must not expect to be so fortunate in his companions as I have been, to take all chances and to start on travels by land if possible, if otherwise on a long voyage. He may feel assured he will meet with no difficulties or dangers, excepting in rare cases nearly so bad as he beforehand anticipates. In other words, normally when we travel, things are not as bad as we might imagine them to be. In a moral point of view, the effect ought to be to teach him good humor, patience, freedom from selfishness. I think here of humility, right? The habit of acting for himself, self-sufficiency would, would be Emerson's point, right? And of making the best of every occurrence. Don't ask why did this happen to me, but rather why did this happen for me? In short, he ought to partake of the characteristic qualities of most sailors. Traveling ought also to teach him distrust. But at the same time, he will discover how many truly kind-hearted people 